The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today is going to be part two on the role of emotions in spiritual maturity. The goal of this fellowship, we say kingdom life, kingdom living is what we expect, but primarily the overall umbrella has always been full stature ministries, which implies what? Full stature, maturity. The emphasis is not baby food, but to bring people up to a higher realm. I almost believe that uh, everyone under our ministry should uh, study the book of Hebrews. And the reason they should study the book of Hebrews, Hebrews was Paul's message to them to tell them, grow up. By reason of time, you should be teachers. And it's very, very easy to fall into the trap that I've been in the church for 20, 30 years, therefore I know. And I'm saying we need to be challenged and be challenged by the Word of God. There's, you don't skip scriptures, but you seek the Lord. On, why is that scripture not something that is a normative part of my life? How far do I need to change in spiritual maturity to consider it pure joy when I fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of my faith is producing patience. You don't hear people saying, oh, I just can't wait to get into that. They skip it. Well, we don't skip nothing here. Here's what I believe. I believe that uh, our mandate for a church is to challenge us. And when I, when I asked a, a man who years ago uh, was doing a doctoral thesis on uh, equippers versus enablers. And he was talking about pastors. Equippers versus enablers. And he told me that, uh, that I was a church that was equipping. And that was a nice compliment, but it caused me to seek the Lord because everything I learned, I learned in the school of the Spirit. And I didn't know what was, diff what was I doing different. I only knew my church. So I wasn't comparing my church with another. So I didn't know, why did I, why did I fall in that category? He said, one out of 70 was equipping, which is pretty hard. And I was the one, which was a nice honor. But that just got my nose to saying, nice honor, but I don't understand it. What did I do different? And the Lord spoke to my heart. And this needs to be in all of your hearts as well. That basically my approach was more of a coach than Joe Heavy Speaker. And the coach basically says, you play the game. I'll troubleshoot with you, but you stand on your own two feet. It's the very thing a parent should want for their children. You stand on your own two feet. I'll be there for you, but I'm not going to do it for you. Okay? And the bottom line, when I prayed about it, the Lord said, Dennis, what, what do you say to the people most of the time, even when you first started pastoring? What did you say? If I can do this, anybody can do it. Did you realize that that attitude then lifts them up to the point where, well, if he can do it, anybody can do it. I'm not anybody. I can do it too. That that is a better equipping mentality. That's a better coaching mentality. Plus the emphasis is that equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. We don't handhold. We don't baby. We don't do for, we're not a welfare church to where we do for you what you should be doing for yourself. It stands out, it does stand out because there is a tendency by leaders to want to be the total source of grace. It makes them feel good to be the total source of grace. Jesus is the source of grace. And he's full of grace and he's full of truth. And we need both, don't we? Now, somebody listening goes, I don't wanna to go to that church. Well, you know what, if you heard it that way, you probably don't need to. I want to see people become all that they can be to reach their maximum potential. And you don't do that by babying anybody, right? The world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And if you can't learn how to, with, how to handle church people, you're not ready for the world. 
They'll eat you up. They'll devour you. Now here's what I am believing for a people that could answer the call of Isaiah 66. And it says basically, but to this kind of man, mankind, ladies, you don't get off the hook here. This is the kind of man that I will look to him who is of a humble and a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. You produce a people like that. To tremble at his word means you don't write off the hard verses. You don't live a life of promise. How many know what promise boxes are? Where they have the little slips of paper in them? Did you notice it's all the promises? I never saw commands in there. Where's the, if you do this, I'll do this. Instead, it's all the promises. You can quote the promises all day long. If you won't walk in the statutes and the commandments of the Lord, what good is that? That's just positive thinking without, without any real anointing. But here's what I believe God is going to prepare people. And this was my mentor as a baby Christian, and I never forgot these four things. This is the way I evaluate my own life with the Lord by these four principles, and they're a challenge. And you're never done being challenged, by the way. You never get to that point. But here it is. First of all, easily approachable. Now that doesn't just mean externally, relationally, buddies. Easily approachable means easy to contact spirit to spirit. I had people that called me pastor that knew me by the spirit, and I had people call me pastor, and it was just a title, and I probably wasn't even their pastor. You know what I'm saying? It was like just a name. But when a person who is of a, of a teachable spirit and a humble spirit, a meek spirit, this kind that is pleasing to the Lord, they have a capacity to communicate spirit to spirit. That means they're approachable, they're easy to touch their spirit. Because you can, you can get a facade with a lot of people. They put on what they want, they project what they want you to think. But actually, the spiritual man discerns all things and they, they can discern a facade. Hmm? And the spiritual man discerns all things. And God tells us that our love would overflow and abound in all real knowledge, intimate knowledge, and discernment. You know what that's actually saying in simple language? I want your love to overflow, but not foolishly. I want you to love with discernment. See, there's a criteria there that takes maturity. Because what people do in their head is, oh, I just did what I thought Jesus would do. Well, that's, you can do that from your head. An unsaved person could do that. That's not being led by the Spirit. You need to be able to contact spirit to spirit in your relationship not only with God, but with others. So the first thing is, are you vulnerable enough and humble enough that you can contact people and know them by the Spirit and they can know you and you can know them? It's the opposite of this. You know what that is? When you're around people, you put up a wall. You know what that wall is? Flesh. You know what that is? Self-protection. You know what else it is when you're around people and you're, you're nervous or shy and you put up a wall? That's, that's basically shutting God off and saying, I'm taking care of this. I'm going to protect myself. I'm not sure. I'm not comfortable in this environment. A truly spiritual person would be like a Holy Spirit uh, uh, Pygmalion or My Fair Lady. You ever seen that movie? It's got the little gutter girl. And she was able to be trained just by her vernacular. She was, she was able to mix in high society any, at any level. God wants you so secure in your spirit that you can move in any circle and be steadfast. And just like uh, Jason's sermon the other week, we need to be steadfast, but we also need to be able to flow in the love of God as the will of God, but not loving foolishly. The culture right now is teaching to love foolishly, love everything, whether it's sinful or not, okay? So you're with me so far. Quality number one for a kingdom life, full stature person is that you're gonna be easy, easily to contact spirit to spirit. You're gonna know one another, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. 
to be comfortable. When we traveled, I know one of the statements that kind of indicate what this was like is we have total strangers come up to us and I attribute it to the anointing, but I attribute it to also a, an openness on us to be truthful. And they would say, I don't know who you are, but I feel like I can trust you. People don't say that unless there is something they actually discern. That was not a product of their head. They didn't figure, I think, I think judging by the way they act, I can't trust them. That doesn't work that way. That's a gut thing. Trust is, a, is in the gut. Trust is the opposite of striving. Trust is yielding and surrendering. But you're so surrendered to God that you can bear witness to what's going on. I can still remember a woman that was having a hard time loving, loving me as a pastor, and I just, that was her issue. I loved her anyway. But she would go, hi, pastor, I love you. And down here it would go. <laughs> so I'd say, bless her heart, she's trying. That's a southern expression. Bless her heart, she was trying. She really was. She was trying to get past whatever it was in her. But you could discern, I'm not really touching her spirit other than feeling the obstacle in her spirit. But like Jennifer, you had fears in your life when we first got married, but the one thing you did before we met and taught you how to deal with the fear is you did it anyway. She was afraid to go to France by herself, so she went all the more. She was afraid to do mountain climbing and sliding down mountains with with an ice axe and everything she did scared her so she did it anyway. One step in getting victory is to face your fear, right? All right. We're going to have a strong spiritual climate. All right. This is not my sermon either, so it's going to be a really part two, three, four, five, six before we're done with this, these emotions. But easily approachable. Did you write that down? What does easily approachable doesn't mean you're the life of the party. Easily approachable means easy to touch them by the spirit. Make spiritual contact. Spirit, easy to contact by the spirit. Secondly, my mentor, I never got to meet him, but my mentor said this statement, and when I was a young Christian, he was the only one because I associated with a number of pastors, but nobody talked like he did. This was Watchman Nee. He died in prison in uh, 1970. And he was the first one that I could identify with, with discernment and discerning of spirits. He says, a broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. Or the slightest movement in the spirit does not go unnoticed by him. You see, it's not, you can fool people with your words and you can fool them with your gestures, but you cannot hide what emanates. Spiritual people will determine the source or the motive behind it. There are people, uh, one of the worst places to have an agenda would be this church, because I can spot an agenda a mile away. An agenda is, uh, it, it's actually idolatrous, even if it's a good thing, because it rules out your interaction with other people unless they can be used for your agenda. And so they become an object and not a true relationship spirit to spirit. You don't meet them spirit to spirit. Does this make sense? And the slightest movement in the spirit doesn't go unnoticed. That's the second quality, highly sensitive. Everything we teach about surrender and yielding, and this is what makes you sensitive. Trying and striving and promoting your agenda is the opposite. And it's discernible. The third element of a mature person who trembles at his word, they're ready for corporate life. They touch the spirit of the body and belong. That's a spiritual function that comes from maturity. Some people n will always be part of a crowd. They never touch the DNA of a body and know that they belong and actually make that connection. It's a level of maturity. 
if you are part of a crowd and you're just looking for a touch from God, then you're still pretty much in the rugged individual mindset. What's in it for me? It was like in my first pastorate, the first time the Lord taught me this as a lesson, not to have an agenda, even a good agenda, was when I started the church, had about 15 people, and there was a half a dozen young men that came. They didn't see any young girls, so they didn't come next week. But next week, there was a half a dozen young girls came because they heard there were some young men there. And the Lord said, that's the story of, the, of, of your life not led by the Spirit. You, all, <laughs> you always wonder why I missed it, right? And actually, even to the point where you're always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Part of maturing is to be in the right place at the right time. And they're ready for corporate life. They're ready to say, this is my tribe. Find your tribe. Actually, I just saw an Elijah list not too long ago. I thought that was interesting. I don't remember who did it, but they said basically, this is time to find your tribe and get under the protection. There's protection in a family unit. That's why when, a, when one of your children uh, is grown and gets married, for this reason, they leave their mother and father that they might cleave unto their wife. They are actually setting up another household of authority. They've left one structure and they're moving into another structure. But people need to realize that in the body of Christ there is that structure and there is safety in it. And the Old Testament version of Amalek coming out of the hills hitting the stragglers, the independents are the ones that usually have the most spiritual warfare but they don't realize the spiritual warfare for the most part is not spiritual warfare, it's their own carnality beating them up and then making themselves vulnerable to the enemy. So ready for corporate life is a sign of maturity. Ready to be open spirit to spirit to belong. The fourth element is they are easily edified. The spiritually mature person is easily edified and I saw it in my first pastorate and I admired it. There were, there were people who sat and uh, I encourage you to take notes but I would see, occasionally I would see the hungriest people would close their eyes and they were taking the anointing on the teaching into their spirit more than the information for their head. You need both, I agree, but it stands out. And when I'm preaching by discernment, I can feel them drawing even more so than someone that's in their head. Is that possible? Sure. So those four elements were not in the notes for today's sermon. But that's the way Watchman Nee mentored me as a baby Christian because I was finding that you could be a leader and you could be a pastor and you could be a very good man but still much of their education was in, in the head and as a matter of fact as a baby Christian I, I mentored a Harvard graduate that, that, that wrote a little note in my Bible that after one year, year and a half of mentoring him and he was brilliant he said what you've taught me was that the education of the mind comes through much study, but the education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. You can't do it with your head. Your spirit needs a relationship with Jesus and it needs to feed instead of read. It needs to drink instead of think. Amen. Though thinking and reading is not bad, but there's something better. All right? Okay, so Father, we just decree and declare that the future Kingdom Life Church and those under full stature ministry in any way, shape, or form that feel that this is their tribe, this is their connection, this is their DNA, then we're going to encourage you to grow in the grace and the knowledge and we exhort you that by reason of time you should be teachers. That's what the book of Hebrews did. They got, by reason of time you should be teaching, you should be reproducing reproducers at this time. There's going to be a huge harvest and particularly 
in this upcoming seminar on dealing with sexual issues. The harvest is going to be too great. Do not dump all these hurting people on the pastor. He can't deal with it. Culture has brainwashed them. But there's a huge harvest. I would, I would say 30% of this church could effectively minister to someone that was hurting emotionally. You agree? Well, let's increase that from 30% to 50% to 75% to as close to 100% as we can get. Equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. All of you should be able, you know, really, 80% of transformation is three steps. Forgive one, two, three. It really is that simple if it's an experience in the heart, if it's a supernatural transaction, not a mental, mental ascent. But it's first person, three F's. One, two, three. First person or situation. Down here into the non-conscious where there's billions of non-conscious thoughts. Not up here where there's 2,000 thoughts. And most of it is wasted on, I'm hungry, my stomach's growling, the chair's too hard, <laughs> it's cold outside, it's too hot in this room, whatever. You only have 2,000 up here. You want, you want to get results? You go down to the spirit where there's, how many, Jennifer? 400, 400 billion non-conscious thoughts. That's why David said, search me, O oh God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. He didn't say, I'll figure it out, God, never mind. I'll think about it for a while. I'll, I'll figure it out. No. You go to God and let be God-searched, not man-searched. When you're God-searched, he'll pull things that you never would have thought of. Secret to you, David said, secret faults. That means they're secret to me. But they're not to God. He knit you together. Let him untangle the knots. All right? So, first person or situation that comes up in prayer, do this for 60 days and you'll be changed. 80% anyway. Drop down to your spirit. What's the feeling? Every thought has a corresponding feeling. And don't tell me you don't feel. I can go to an unsaved person and say, do you know the difference between being stressed and relaxed? I've never had anybody say, no, I don't understand that. <laughs> Every thought has a corresponding feeling. And men, oh, I like to get men who don't have feelings. They think that's feminine. Men, stress. What does stress mean? Any, any man ever not, not know what stress is? It's a feeling. And you know what kind of feeling? It means you're being emotionally, oh, there's that word. You're being emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. Ooh. I don't want to be controlled by people and circumstances. Stress is the opposite of trusting God. You cannot trust God and be stressed at the same time. <laughs> That's impossible. All right. Now for the message, part two. You cannot be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow you. Remember the time we were in that grocery store, Jennifer? Man in a three-piece suit. We assumed he was on break from work. I mean, most people don't walk around in a three-piece suit. And he was in a grocery store, and his face was beet red, and he was bouncing on his toes. I wouldn't buy anything in this store ever again. Jennifer and I looked at each other and said, damage, age three. There was a 50-year-old man acting like a three-year-old in a grocery store. Those emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And if you don't deal with them, something in life will trigger it, and then you will act accordingly. And it's not predictable because they're like time bombs buried alive in you. And something triggers it, and all of a sudden, if you know that you need some areas dealt with in your life, when's the last time that mild stimulation caused an eruption of emotion from you? Hmm? That's usually an indication that there is a root issue that repeats itself over and over. There's that same old reaction. Hmm. Right? All right. Part two. The function of emotion. Our emotional life is both comprehensive and complicated. 
That's what I like about the spirit because it's not, it's not complicated. I once had a guy who was telling me that he had all these sexual issues mainly because he was a complicated person. Aw. I said, well, that's great. I said, we can get to the root of this because guess what? Everything in God is simple. <laughs> Satan is rooted in pride. God is rooted in humility. Let's pull down that pride of you being a complicated person. Let's repent of being a complicated person. Let's go to the simplicity that's in Jesus. He got ministry. Sometimes you have to poke that pride. I'm a complicated. Well, other people can get ministry like that, but I can't because I'm a complicated person. That's the voice of arrogance. That's all that is. You're not complicated. God knit you together in your mother's womb. He's not confused by any of this. And if there's tangles in there, he's the only one I really trust to go and untangle me. Right? Now, there's three elements in our emotional life, uh, various expressions. There's the fruit of the Spirit. Those are the God emotions. Those are good things. All right? The second one is what we would call <clears throat> desires and appetites. Those are those things like when, when I see donuts, especially the ones at QT. I think they drug the sugar <laughs> because it's... But it's like desires are things that are in you, God-given, but they rise up and they want to pull you away from Jesus. Now, what's Jesus' solution? Moderation. So it's like, I can have that donut, but maybe I shouldn't eat a dozen. <laughs> All right. So that desire then is brought under. Paul says, I've crucified my appetites and my desires. I've been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to me. So there's voices coming at you from the world, the flesh, and the devil. All right? But there's a way to crucify that to where moderation then rules. Now, the third element is just plain feelings, carnal emotions. They're physiological. Uh, the danger with these three elements, now you would say one is good, right? The fruit of the Spirit is good. But I'm telling you, if you're going to mature, you're going to have to get the victory over all three. Victory over the fruit of the Spirit? Mm-hmm. Yep. You're going to have to get victory and be, to become proficient and really enter into a pure Spirit-to-Spirit -spirit relationship with God. You're going to have to find a way to have the Lord rule over lust, appetite, agendas, and even over feelings. Now, feelings can come from the outside. You know, if you're at a birthday party and you're having fun, oh boy, but it's an external stimulation, isn't it? I want to get people so spiritually mature that you basically are the same on the inside regardless of the outside. Because if all of a sudden somebody comes and crashes the party externally, bleh, you can't live there. You've got to live by a steadfastness in patient with people and steadfast in circumstance. Colossians 1, uh, 9, 10, and 11 teaches you that. To be steadfast with joy. Oh, wait a minute. Can't do that in the flesh, can you? Steadfast in circumstances and patient with people. Colossians 1, 9, 9 and 10. That's a walk that's worthy of the Lord. Steadfast in circumstances and patient with people. That's all of life, isn't it? There's no, there's no third element. It's either people or circumstances. But it says with joy. That's supernatural. That's going to require a surrender to the Lordship of God, regardless of the externals that are taking place. That applies to your office, that applies to school, that applies to any realm that you're in 90% of the week. Now, overcoming is going to have to be all three. And, and let, let me say something here for Christians. Why would I want you to overcome the fruit of the Spirit? Is because primarily 
it's the will that needs to will one thing. It needs to be the will of God. The devil is working from the outside to get your will, and God is working from the inside to get your will. That's the realm of authority and spiritual strength. Not I, but Christ that lives within me. This life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So it's a union and a communion with Him. But the best example was, and I shared this in part one, but I'm going to share it again. When I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I couldn't find people that had the same kind of experience. I was open visions and everything. And even the pastors I associated with, they, they didn't have that kind of a thing. And we talked about the difference and the strengths and the weaknesses of that. But the first lesson the Lord taught me was it was so solid joy for so long that I looked around. I would walk up to people and they'd start crying, unsaved people. And I knew that that was an anointing. But it was like this is the way it's going to be the rest of my life. And that lasted three months and then it stopped. And he does that on purpose. And every one of you had a rich experience at one time that stopped. Why did it stop? Then what do you do? You go into a tailspin. I must have committed some unpardonable sin. I must have done. No, 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 no. Because what God said was, was basically what he did to me. I went to a church and there was 80 people getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And I already had the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to figure out what, did, what happened when it all left. And Ralph Wilkerson from Melody Land, California at that time was, was the visiting, and he was praying for baptism. And I said, I don't need the baptism. So a little humility here. Oh God, let me be last out of the 80 people because these people need filled with the Spirit. I don't need that. I got to find out what's wrong. And I want to talk to this man. Well, guess what? I was 80 of the 80 people getting filled with the Holy Spirit. So I was there for about two hours. And when he came up to me, Finally, it was my turn. He comes, he starts laughing. I'm going, this is not funny. I had to join the Lord. I don't have to join the Lord no more. And he says, son, before you tell me anything, I want to tell you a story. He said, when I was a young man, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was floating on a cloud, and the joy of the Lord was my strength. And I feel, and see, when I felt, when I had it happen, I thought my skin was going to burst, that we would need a new body, the joy was so strong. But now it was gone. And he says, when I was a young man, he says, and the Lord told me that I loved his joy more than I loved him. I was... Uh, I'm going to peel me off the floor. And that's when I prayed that prayer, you know. God, if I never feel the joy again, <laughs> I'm going to love you and serve you all the days of my life. And instantly it came back. And from that time on, it's very subtle, very quiet but I could practice the presence of God and everything we teach is probably coming out of that ability to discern. To discern has nothing to do with your head knowledge. To discern is to make distinctions in the spirit. That people can say the right words and not have something happening down here. I mean, Jennifer thought it was huge that we taught forgiveness to the body of Christ at large on how easy it was, mainly because I learned by discernment that people were saying the right words, but down here nothing was happening. And so they, they developed the theology, forgiveness must take a long time, because it sure taken me a long time. Did it take a long time when you got saved? No, then it hasn't changed. Now maturity might take a while, and emotional healing may take a while, sanctification may, but forgiveness and repentance is instant as soon as you cooperate. If it's hard, you're trying in your head to do it. And you're sincere. And my heart really bleeds for the people that are sincere. Because they have a struggle when all of a sudden you tell a sincere person, you've been doing it wrong for the last two years. You know, I wouldn't say it that way if I were you. But that's the truth. It's very humbling to know that I've been giving my effort to this thing. And... You're saying it's easy. Did you know the church has a gift, a not very good gift, of making it harder than it is? Yes. Historically, 
Can you imagine what Martin Luther probably went through, what we went through on forgiveness? Martin Luther, no, you don't have to kneel on glass for six years. No, you just, it's, you're saved by faith. Oh, right, right. After all I've done, this guy comes along and says, you're saved by faith through grace. It's a gift of God. Oh, just receive it. You think he was, had a little bit of a persecution thing? Think there was a little resistance? You know who the resistance would come from? Religious people, right? Who want to make it hard because it was hard for them. By golly, we better keep it hard. What about those wonderful Pentecostals? Turn of the century, 1900. You know what scripture they pulled out of that beautiful scripture of you will be endued with power from on high, tarry for me in Jerusalem? Out of all of those scriptures on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, they got people to speak in tongues, but they emphasized tarry. I knew Pentecostals that didn't speak in tongues and they've been tarrying for 14 years. 14 years they're waiting, they're tarrying. <laughs> we have a knack for making it harder than it is. So someone comes along and brings an acceleration, not everybody's going to be happy with it. Right. It's too easy. I don't believe it's as easy as Dennis and Jennifer are saying it is. Well, it is, if you do it from the heart. If there's no supernatural exchange, though, you didn't do it. You've got to be honest with yourself. You can say all the right words. And what is this church strongest in? Confession, declaration, preach, prophesy. But if it's not connected. I saw Benny Hinn one time say, and the name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. <laughs> Think about it. Seven sons of Sceva tried to do deliverance with that name. Didn't work. There must be a supernatural exchange. There must be a transaction. And how do I know as a believer, if 1 John 2, 20, uh, 7, 29, you have an anointing that abides within and you shouldn't need anyone to teach you. Does that mean we don't need teachers? No. What's that mean? There's teaching for your head, for information. But the teaching that is in you is the Holy Spirit needs to take that truth and paint it on the tablet of your heart. You have that in you. You have that capacity. You can do it. Now, <clears throat> we, what we have, though, unfortunately, is the need to die to even those feelings of joy was that my prayer basically clicked it over as long as you maintain that prayer as an attitude. I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Jennifer's most phenomenal breakthrough. I, I just really, I just, how many people would have done that? That commute, 70 miles one way, 140 mile commute to work and did that for years until her body couldn't take it any longer. She was a single parent raising her daughter, leave the house when it's dark, come home when it's dark. And after three years, what did she do? Murmur, complain, do the six C's, a complain, criticize. No, you know what she said? God, I don't think my physical body is able to take this. I'm going down to Santa Rosa Beach for prophetic presbytery and I'm gonna have the prophets of God come and speak a word to me and tell me what. And basically one of them said, Jennifer, you can have whatever you want. God says you can have whatever you want. Would that appeal to your flesh if nothing else? And Jennifer goes, oh geez, just an easy life. <laughs> and then the real Jennifer rose up. No, if this misery that I'm experiencing, this hardship that I'm going through, if that is your best, I want your best. If that's your best, I'll take it. Oh, if we could get believers to abandon themselves at that level. It's hard telling what God would do in your life when he knows that that's your heart. You can fool people with your words, you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what's in the heart. And the mind can't change what you believe in your heart. The heart affects the mind. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. From that time forward, she began to walk in her destiny. And that's a story in and of itself. 
But from that day forward, you want to fulfill your destiny, your purpose with God? You're just going to have to be, I want God more than anything. I want God more than feeling. And that includes the fruit of the Spirit. I want to love Him more than I love the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And quite frankly, those are the people that, for me, practicing the presence of God is a, is a constant. There's a constant awareness, and you can do it too. It's not a big bolt of lightning. It's, it's what, even when he speaks, it's a still small voice, but you've quieted your, your flesh enough to bear witness to the still small voice, but you also quieted your flesh enough to commune, to sense, I'm with a person right now. Whether there's a word or not a word, I'm with him. And when I just said that, uh, a good portion, I don't know about everywhere, but over this portion, you did it down here, you dropped down. You dropped down while I was talking. That was perceivable. You see, that's, that's a capacity that you have that we all have. It's not, I'm Joe Heavy Speaker and I can do this stuff. I train myself by reason of use, just like the rebuke to the Hebrews, by reason of use, having your senses exercised. If you don't practice something, you don't get any better at it. Every one of you has discerned in the spirit from the time you got saved at some point. Many times you override it with much thinking, but you'd have been better off going with the gut. How many have seen that in hindsight? From now on, use that as school and say, next time I'm going with my gut. <laughs> your gut knows more than your head knows in the spirit realm. Now, a believer's emotional life, I've seen them look like bipolar Christians. They were used to the thrill and the excitement. There's that group. But then they will look for the thrill and the excitement and they'll be like Elijah where it has to be in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire, they can't hear the still small voice. And so they will use that as their criteria of spirituality. That's why you have to even die to the fruit of the Spirit and the pleasantries of His presence. And the funny thing is when you die to it, you get it. You try to get it and you will strive and miss it. You Except the grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. If you lose the lower life, you gain the higher life. So what do you have to do? Lose that lower life of trying to get it. And just lose the lower life, you'll gain the higher life. Here's the part that, that I feel is so necessary, is that the enemy can use your carnal emotions from the outside. If you are a person that has not learned to surrender to the Lordship, he can play you like a, like a fiddle. He can... He can produce, because he's on the outside, good feelings and bad feelings. Especially if he puts a bad feeling on you and you, I can't go to church today, I, I'm bummed. That's all the more reason God is waiting to see, what do you do without the good feeling? Do you go anyway? Or do you succumb to the bad feeling? Because then the enemy can manipulate you the rest of your life because you're feeling oriented and all he has to do is change the atmosphere. What did the Lord teach us, Jennifer? Oh, something good's coming. Not only that, but it actually saved our life. Huh. I remember one time, how many are familiar in North Carolina on 77 where you're up in the mountains, there's those truck runoffs? Yeah. You ever seen them? We were coming back from a mission uh, uh, in New England. New England's like a foreign country. Uh, it was a real mission trip. but. Anyway, we were coming back home, and all of a sudden, on that extreme downward slope, traffic stopped dead. And what we did with traveling ministry is there's so many things that can go, going church to church, you can meet all kinds of people, needy people, like, okay, 
and you have to navigate and keep your peace because the goal is to minister, to teach them. And we're, we're sitting in the car and we said, nothing's gonna phase us. We've got this stuff in our books. This is how valuable it is. We yield to God that this is basically his purpose, right? Getting stressed, by the way, did getting stressed in a situation like that, did it ever do anything? Nope. Did it ever change anything? That's like kicking the lawnmower that doesn't work. <laughs> did it repent? Did the lawnmower ever change? You know, those are irrational behaviors. So we just sat and we released it. But you know, as we sat there, all I care about is the will of God. And I'm in the will of God, whether there's traffic backed up for who knows how long. But in that stillness, you can perceive little tiny nuances that normally, if you're upset, you would miss. Upset misses the best supernatural. And I felt led to just move over into the next lane. It accomplished next to nothing. That's the second time that same thing happened. Moved to the next lane. Then I looked in a rear view mirror. Here is a 18 wheeler smoking, with the brakes smoking, and it's, it's using the guardrail to stop it. And sparks are flying, the brakes are smoking, and it ended up right where our car was before it came to a final stop. And I'm saying, you know, <laughs> just that little inkling to move over one lane that accomplished nothing. Yeah, that's the downside is the traffic backed up was blocking the runaway truck ramp. He had no choice. And that even on the other side of that guardrail is pretty spooky, steep. Wouldn't you want to get to the place to where it's just you and God and you don't go by those feelings because the enemy can work externally. He wants your will. And if he can get a Christian who reacts to the negative, bummed out time, we learn that when we feel like there's a pressure to be bummed out and you can feel it come against you, you know it's outside of you, not inside of you. We go, something good's coming. Right? And it always happens. There's always a breakthrough. You succumb to it, and you're, you're, you're just putty in the hands of the enemy. He said, watch this. All I got to do is put an external feeling on them, and they will, they'll, they'll just get bummed out. Carnal emotions can be formidable by the enemy. Emotions can be the most formidable enemy in the life of a spiritual Christian because they got too feeling-oriented in their life. And I'm telling you, there's nothing better than what the Lord showed me about surrender and yielding my will. I was sitting, I was pastoring by this time, and I was, I was in my office, and I was just yielding and enjoying Him. And the Lord showed me where, for whatever reason, I always pictured my will. I know it's the door of the heart, and I know you open the door, you yield, you surrender. But I always pictured it like a handlebar. I don't know why. But like a handlebar, if... If I was white knuckling it, I was in control. If I let go of the handlebar, like riding a bicycle without, you know, okay. Anyway, then God was in control, all right? And one day, I'm yielding and I'm going, I'm feeling a little tense down here, and I let it go. And the Lord says, give me your will, and I will wrap my will around it. And I knew that was scriptural, because Isaiah 40 says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Actually, that means there will be an exchange of strength. And God wraps progressively the cable of his will around that bar, my will. And after he wrapped his, I saw him wrapping his strength, all of a sudden God gave me a picture of it becoming a scepter of authority, God's will. It went from a bar to a scepter. And from that time on, I knew that, that real authority is being under authority. And it's a scepter of authority because then anything God initiates from that point on, it will not fall to the ground. It is an absolute in every case. God goes, it, there's life on it, right? 
Remember the king would use a, extend a scepter for life or death. Well, God's scepter is life. And he would extend that. I'm not following my notes whatsoever, but I have a lot of them here. Uh, <laughs> uh, you understand, if a person cannot even handle the slightest mishap without an emotional response, there is a level of immaturity there that's got to change. You realize that? Or another way to look and say, God, what is the root to it if mild stimulation causes a radical outburst? Like uh, maybe the husband prefers beef over chicken and the wife says, honey, I, I tried to make it special today. I made uh, chicken parm and thought maybe you would like it like that. Chicken! Chicken again! What am I doing? There's a chicken! What's wrong with you, woman? I would say mild stimulation that produces an outrageous response, there is a root. That's not a once-in-a-lifetime situation. You tapped into something that is a regular problem in that person's life. I'd like to know the root to that one. You know? Were you offended by a chicken at some point? Were you pecked by a chicken in your childhood? What was it? What caused that? There's something seriously at stake here. And it's not steak, it's chicken. All right? <laughs> Psalm 131, verse 2. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. That is the goal of a true spiritual person. Those four qualities that we mentioned in the beginning, it's going to require you knowing how to silence that noisy mind, will, and emotions. And how to flow in love. The church does not, in its attempt to love, has a tendency to love foolishly. Not loving with discernment. Remember all the little bracelets, what would Jesus do? That actually puts a person up here. Now hopefully you, you have a, a biblical, <laughs> moral, ethical, do unto others as you would have them do unto you at least. But the benefit is not to inquire what would Jesus do to your head, but to inquire of him what would you want me to do in this situation. The other way is, is mental, and I saw people trying to pour out and do loving things when God wasn't even in it. And then you get frustrated, burned out. Real discernment tells you who to say yes to and who to say no to. Really. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is from the evil one. So you could be manipulating. There's people that do good for other people only because it makes them feel good, not because they care about the people. Motive is everything with God. This is the one that I'm going to look at. The one who has a humble spirit and a contrite heart, who trembles at my word. And if you tremble at his word, you want his initiation, not your good idea. Good idea is not a God idea. All right. We are under the government of voice. Jot this down. This is something the Lord spoke to me some time ago. You know, we're word people. We're under the government of voice. But there's something we need to understand about the voice. The voice is not just words, because the devil could quote scripture. It's the nature that's attached to the words. That's the true voice. You ever seen, uh, Facebook used to have, have articles on this all the time about shepherds that would call their sheep. You could say the same thing that shepherd calls and the sheep won't respond because the, they know the nature on the voice, not the words. Christians are good at the words, but not necessarily is the nature attached to the words anointed. Does that make sense? My sheep know my voice. I like it in I, I, Isaiah 66. When I think of us being under the government of voice, there's a scripture in there that there is a voice of chaos from the city 
a voice from the temple and the voice of the Lord. And quite frankly, the voice from the temple is not necessarily the voice of the Lord. You have to be able to determine if his nature is on it. In Jesus' day, his worst critics were the Pharisees, and that was the voice of the temple, and what they spoke didn't have the nature of God. He says, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. They point to me and you won't come to me. You don't want intimacy with me. You don't recognize your Messiah. But you're going to quote scriptures to Jesus and you're going to tell him how unscriptural he is, are you? That's what they did. So there's a voice from the city. And right now, we've got to prepare for a harvest of people because the voice of the city, the culture, has, has literally done a number on people. Everything is okay now. And that's why we want to, we're going to do that sexual issue seminars because when little kids come home from school and say, Mommy, am I a boy or am I a girl? You know what? There's enough hardship in that area in life. We don't need to compound it. Someone's got the silence in the church on the subject is deafening. And I'm saying if we stay silent on it, we agree with the culture by default. So uh, this is not my favorite thing to teach on. Oh, gee, what do you like to teach on? Oh, I think we'll do all sexual issues. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, is there not a cause? Really, is there not a cause? You know how many, it's the elephant in the church. It's the hurting people that basically, where are they going to go to? Go to the culture? No, just, oh, that's okay. That's okay. That's what their friends are going to say. So if the church doesn't stand up and approach that elephant that's in the church, that includes pornography. All the sexual issues need to be covered. And except for the grace of God, there go you, there go I. And don't tell me, thank God I'm not like that. Actually, that's the person that probably needs help. Right? It's, it's the most effective, the sexual area is the most effective tool of the enemy on the church. And we've got to be willing to know how to be properly equipped to help people out of that. Well, we didn't get very far in my notes. But I'll tell you one thing. We're going to have to get to the point where we're going to know the difference between life that is quickened by the Spirit in us compared to hype in a meeting even, even a church meeting. There is there can be external hype that can make you feel good because it's coming from the outside. But you're going to have to know the difference. Is there life on it or not? Remember that little thing? Even, even our young millennials are, are getting more uh, uh, discerning with some of their worship music. I saw a Facebook thing that was kind of amusing where they're standing next to each other. They go, oh, do you feel that avocado, pineapple? Oh, do you feel the anointing on pineapple, avocado? I mean, it's a, it's a pun. It's like... They don't even know what the words mean, and they're looking for a feeling. No, avocado, pineapple, that's not in the Bible. You know, huh? Tortellini, tortellini, pineapple, avocado. Ooh, did you feel that? Did you feel that? Do you realize how susceptible you are to external? Even my youngest son, when he was in church and he was a little boy, he's over there singing about, and they went to Zion, Zion, and then he goes, Dad, What's a Zion? <laughs> yeah. At some point, we're going to have to tell if when we sing about Zion, if it has anointing on it or not. It's not the right words. It's the source, the source. Let your love overflow in real intimate knowledge and all discernment translated. Let your love overflow, but not foolishly. With discretion with the prompting of the Lord. Oh my goodness, and I didn't even get to part two yet. Ah. Oh. Okay, two reasons, and we're gonna close with this. Two reasons why people <clears throat> walk by their emotions. First of all, it's easy. They never really learned to walk in the spirit nor have they even sought to walk in the Spirit, they will naturally walk according to any movement of emotion. The 
they never really learned the, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and letting the word work as a work of the cross, okay? That's one. The other one is those have experienced that inner work and they know what it's like to really do have a work of the cross but they can easily be overwhelmed by emotion and they choose to own that 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 atmosphere or not to own the atmosphere and they'll say i'm stuck when a person says they're stuck, by the way, if you ever minister on anybody and they say they're stuck, we're saying that transformation is Jesus in you doing the work. It's according to Philippians 2.13. It is God who is at work in you to both will and to perform. It's the, it's the supernatural function, even like forgiveness. It's your recreated human spirit that's, that's fused together with him. And it's the two of you forgiving out of your heart when you yield. That's a supernatural. When a person says they're stuck, you know what? They're back up here going, they got the wall up there. Part of them wants to forgive and part of them says they don't deserve it. Part of them wants to do it, part of them don't want to do it. So we tell them, agree with the spiritual part of you that wants to. <laughs> the real you, by the way. The new creation you. Because that's the only way it can be done. It can't be done by willpower. It's done by basically my will and his will fused together to where it's a supernatural transaction. If, it's, if forgiveness and repentance is not a supernatural transaction, it didn't, you didn't do it. And if you're stuck, part of you doesn't want to. Or part of you thinks you can do it better than God. Yeah. Or part of you thinks that I'm going to do this without God. In reality, an unsaved person, when they forgive, an unsaved person, when they forgive, there's no spiritual transformation that takes place. They will end up doing it again, and again, and again after that. They're just biding time. They're coping. There's no transformation. Coping is not transformation. But God wants us to be governed by principles. God builds according to a pattern based on a principle. But I want to see us get to the place to where we can pray that prayer. Can we pray that prayer together? I want the will of God regardless of how I feel. And how you respond when the feelings are bad will determine the rest of your Christian life. I mean, come on, can you remember even as a baby Christian, I don't feel like going to church today. Everything went wrong yesterday. And then you went anyway, and you felt a rejuvenation. That's God trying to train you to ride above those things. He didn't just, because it was such a glorious service, he was trying to teach you that that is the response he's looking for. He's trying to train you. That's why a lot of times, I'm glad that I did. I didn't feel like it, but I'm glad that I did. That's his way of training you to not go by the negative feeling, right? So Father, we pray right now. If I never feel a good feeling again, wow. If I never get goosebumps again, if I never feel the joy of the Lord, I love you more than even the joy of the Lord. I love you more than hype. And I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And when I feel that negative opposition, I'm going to face it and go through it. And the funny thing is, is the good feelings come back. You can't twist God's arm. You can't trick them. But when you deal with it properly in the heart, on the other side, there's freedom. It's death, burial, and resurrection. So, Father, we thank you that you gave us emotions for the fruit of the Spirit, but you never wanted us to worship the fruit of the Spirit above you. So from this day forward, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. I'm not going to live by feelings, and I'm not even going to let the fruit of the Spirit be the total sign that I'm pleasing to you. Here's what the Lord showed me. 
close your eyes, whether you feel anything or not, you went to Jesus, you honor him. Train yourself that I'm honoring you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, when I close my eyes and get in your presence, I'm honoring you, I'm not looking for a particular result. I'm just simply saying I'm making myself available totally and completely to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's pray through for a root. Anybody have any actions or reactions to the same old thing? Really need that book, Bitter Roots. There's people that their whole lives were changed once they got a handle on this from what we teach. If you don't understand this, you'll struggle. But you could really expedite the maturity process in your life if you deal with root issues instead of just the same old, same old. You can go around the mountain 20 times and get sanctified, or you can say, God, where did I give in to that in the first place? Let's close that door radical. Because only the cross stops reaping a harvest. You sow a seed, you reap a harvest. You want to stop the harvest that's bad? How many have a bad harvest? <laughs> I'm doing good, but in this one area that has a root to it. Let's pray. Father, right now, just say, that same old, same old. I'm doing good in most of the areas of my Christian walk, but there's that same old, same old that crops up. If it's the same old, same old, there's a root to that. I'm going to ask you right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, show me, God, where did I give in to that? Where did I give place to that? The first situation that comes up, just simple three steps. You're taking it to Jesus in your heart, that situation, feel the feeling, and let that forgiver in me, my spirit and Jesus' spirit fuse together. And let that forgiveness flow right through that emotion until it changes to peace. When I can see that person or situation in my mind's eye, and feel peace or nothing down in the gut, there was a supernatural transaction that only God can do through my human spirit, fused together with his. That's a we function. I yielded my will down in my Bible heart, not in my spirit. Now, the scripture says, test the spirit. Go back, open your eyes. If you did it right, close your eyes again. See that specific situation. And the peace should remain. When there's a supernatural transaction, the fruit remains for life on that one issue. And if there's peace, on something that's unpleasant in your mind, a root issue, you rule over that area from this point forward. Jesus is Lord. Peace is the evidence that he's ruling. Let the peace of God rule. Did I go too fast for some of you? No. Let's do another one because this you can help someone else with. Close your eyes. Remember, we're going for the, we're going from the how many billion, Jennifer? 400? We're going to the 400 billion. This is not in your head. You're going to your heart. Say, God, search my heart. I will deal with whatever comes up. No matter how silly, just like a little child, I'll just deal with it. First person or situation. Nod your head if something came up. Feel the feeling that's attached to it. Nod your head when you can feel. Okay. Now let the Jesus in you, you yield your will, that new creation. I yield to the forgiver in me, and I let him go to that feeling and carry it away. Out of my belly flows a river of forgiveness. 
loving forgiveness flowing out of my innermost being. I can see that person and I can feel joy coming from the corporate anointing. How many had a change to joy? Raise your hand because it was strong. It was strong enough to feel it up here. On the other side of forgiveness is not just peace, but very often joy and love that's flowing out to them. The Lord taught me the first time that I forgave properly from the heart, when I, after the forgiveness flowed out and removed the barrier, I could feel love. God says, now confess, prophesy, preach, teach, declare, decree. Not until you feel the love flowing so that it's got the proper basis. Proud of the abundance of the heart, the overflow, the mouth speaks. Okay. You're all saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit now. Now we're going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God in the days ahead, correct? And if I never feel a good feeling again, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Right? And if I feel bad, my first thought's going to be, whoa, something's good's on the other side of this. For the joy set before me, I'm going to endure this one. I'm going to overcome. No barrier's going to stop me. Okay? All right, you're dismissed. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.